the northeastern corner of Australia, where the top end meets the sea, lurks a relic from the days of the dinosaurs. saltwater crocodile. One of the most fearsome predators on the face of the earth. But even salties have their sweeter side. Like most wild animals, they just want to be left alone to feed, breed and rear their young. Crocs are complex creatures, finely tuned to their surroundings. But since this grows into this, it's easy to see why their reputation goes before them. Oh. This is an Australian saltwater crocodile. And you've got to be really careful when you're dealing around these huge predators. They've got volatile speed and very, very powerful. I'm Steve Earle. And I've been around big saltwater crocodiles all of my life. Crocs and people normally give each other a wide berth. But most of the crocs here at my park in Queensland had to be removed from the wild because they crossed the line and became a threat to humans. If we'd left them where they were, they'd have probably ended up being shot. And you can't lock them all up. I'm hoping to come up with a better solution. We call this desperado Agro. He's the wildest croc we've got in the park. And right now, he's hungry. I want to give my crocs as natural life as possible, which means there's wild pig on the menu and I'm using myself as live bait. Watch Agro slip into an ambush position. Right now, I've got no idea of knowing where he'll strike from. He's made himself completely invisible. Well, Agro by name and by nature. He's a real hungry animal. Feral pig, best food source, but he's very territorial. Got to be really careful when you enter into his territory. Got to play by his rules. Here in Australia, they call me the Crocodile Man. When a croc like Agro starts playing up, I'm often the first one to hear about it. I've just had a call about another problem croc, but this time I won't be bringing him back to the park. I want to try a new idea. Crocs like Agro can live for a hundred years and they have long memories. I want to see if we can teach them to mend their ways, give them a lesson they'll never forget. If it works, we can leave them where they belong in the wild. An operation like this takes teamwork. That's where my wife Terry comes in. And Wes, my right hand man. It's a bit like tying down the Queen Mary, what are you doing? Well, at least ours won't fall off, mate. <laughs> and I wouldn't go anywhere without Dugger. We've got a long journey ahead of us to catch up with the latest troublemaker.
from our starting point near Brisbane. It's a three day drive north into croc country. Saltwater crocs are found right across the top end of Australia. Until they were protected in the 70s, they were heavily hunted for their valuable skins. Now populations are recovering, but more and more people are entering crocodile territory, even in the most remote areas, and that means trouble. We're headed for Lakefield National Park, a key area for crocodile conservation. It's November, the end of the dry season, and the coastal wetlands are parched. Even the rivers eventually dry up. Any water that's left becomes very precious. With temperatures over 100 degrees, the best thing to do is while away the day in a shady wallow. Keeping cool is a top priority. Like all reptiles, a croc's body temperature is governed by its surroundings. This one looks like a big old male. Older crocs are usually darker in colour. This lighter specimen is a much younger croc. In croc society, there's only room for one king of the pond. The biggest, strongest male will drive any rivals out of his domain. He's usually the one hassling humans too. But if you take him away, you disrupt the hierarchy of the croc community. Weaker males will fight for his crown and mate with the females passing on weaker genes. Despite their name, salties aren't confined to tidal regions. They also inhabit freshwater lagoons. There they rub shoulders with Australia's other croc, the smaller freshwater variety, far less aggressive than its much larger relative. Freshies are too small to do you or me any real damage, but this little bird is pushing its luck. You can tell a freshie from a salty by its long, narrow snout, well worth knowing when you're out in the bush. While freshies eat small prey, like crayfish or even insects, a salty might fancy a piece of you. During the dry, water acts like a magnet for all kinds of wildlife, a mobile menu for the crocs. Wild pigs destroy the riverbanks rooting for food. Since being introduced to Australia from Europe, they've become a real pest. All this wildlife attracts human visitors to the waterhole too. It's a favourite spot for campers. And bird watchers. In these peaceful surroundings, people tend to forget what could be lurking in the water. Barry, Lakefield's head ranger, is there to remind them that this is salty territory and that requires some respect. Today, mate. How's it going? All right. Croc attacks on humans are very rare. One death every two or three years in Australia, but when they do strike, that's it. It's game over. And a big salty can easily hide in shallow, murky water. After three days on the road, I'm itching to get on with the job. When we arrive at Lakefield, we're met by Barry and his fellow rangers from the national parks who guide us to the trouble spot. Because of the problem croc, the area is closed to the public at the moment.
This is our destination, Old Faithful Waterhole. And Barry tells me there's a big male been hanging around the campsite. It's the perfect salty stamping ground. Plenty of shade, and these high banks make great nesting sites. But humans like it too. Here's where the conflict begins. This is a really popular fishing hole. And when the fishermen come back and clean their fish, they leave their scales and offal in and around the water. And that creates a free feed for the crocodile. These bullet shells are a result of the fishermen getting scared. They see a croc, they think it's stalking them. Boom! They take a pot shot at it. I'm here to help humans, but also protect the crocodile. First I want to have a scout around the area with the help of Barry and his fellow ranger Ron. Everybody right? Yeah mate. This is their patch of bush and they can show me any signs of recent croc activity. That way I'll know the best place to set up a couple of traps. Meanwhile, Terry is going to be pretty busy setting up camp. The bank opposite is the best place for me to start. It's an ideal basking area for a croc. Nice gentle slope down to the water. Ron soon spots something. Oh, that's a nice little wallow, Ron. Real nice. Be about a... What do you reckon, about nine foot female? Mm, about that, eh? Yeah, nice uh, slide mark in there. Beautiful, cool location for her. Spend a bit of time there by the look of it. Yeah, too right. A couple of nice footprints here too, Ron. She's gone back into the water. Nice tail mark. When do you reckon she used it last? Not too long ago, last night or this morning even. This morning, yeah. Yeah. I reckon. Well, there's obviously a female around, but it's the big male we're after, and I reckon he's somewhere close by. This is a great crocodile slide, exactly what we're looking for. It's got all the signs that we need. Here's his footprints. As he's headed back down into the water, you can see the distance between his footprints. Gives us an idea of his over 14 feet in length. His belly's dragged on the ground as he's headed back towards the water. This is a great place to set the trap. He's coming up here to sun himself. Beautiful basking area. He's female just up there. We'll set a trap pretty close by. Have a look at this. It's the big bloke himself. It's the breeding season, and that always causes extra conflict. Maybe that's what got him all steamed up recently. As he patrols his turf, other crocs steer well clear. These young females swim quickly away, raising their snouts to show they know who's boss. An older female is more receptive to his advances. He moves in as she signals her interest. He's a gentle lover. Gradually, they shift into a position for mating. Which takes place with the female fully submerged beneath the male.
With the dominant male occupied, smaller males like this one might get a look in on the mating front. It's an opportunity not to be missed. He quickly pairs off with a young female, resting on a handy mud bank to mate. There's no time to lose. If the big guy spots this invasion of his territory, he'll attack without hesitation. But this time, the young males got away with it. For me and the team, it's time to get to work. This is the ideal location for our crocodile trap site. This is a natural gully, and I'm gonna utilize the crocodile's keen sense of smell to lure him in. I'm gonna run barricades up each side of the trap because I've seen crocodiles come in from the side, get a scare or kill the trap, and then retreat. We want him coming up, right up to the back of the trap and grabbing hold of that big piece of bait. So what I'm doing here is placing these sticks. I don't use steel or star pickets in my trap design because when the croc comes in and he's fighting, you can hit these sticks and he can't hurt himself, whereas if he bumps into steel, he can break his teeth or scar his head, hurt his eye. So these will break and get out of the way. So we'll run a stream of them up here and along the other side to support the trap. So you can um, grab a corner here, lift the corner here, just pull it up for a sec. So what we utilise here is breakable hemp string. And that's uh, tied onto the tree, which supports the weight of the trap and holds it into position. Just a couple of simple knots. So as when the croc goes inside the trap, grabs hold of it and struggles, the string breaks off and the trap will drop loose around him so the croc hasn't got a vantage point where he can get in and actually break through the trap. This is the trigger mechanism. It's absolutely crucial. So we have a nail low and a nail high and that supports a little steel rod which holds the weight bags up. When the croc grabs hold of the bait, that pulls the weight bag, whew, down she goes. Meanwhile, Wes has spotted our target croc. Oh, I see. Holy oh, snap and duck shit. Have a look at that. Look at that for a hit. Looks like he's checking us out. It's probably his curiosity that got him into trouble in the first place. He's a big one, all right, at least a 14-footer. We're up to the final job now, placing the bait. This is a feral pig. Big saltwater crocs find these irresistible. We've got to get the big chunk of bait up there and a lead-in bait at the front to lure him in. He's been hanging around. I'm just a little bit nervous. What I'm going to do is split the pig open, let its blood run down, soak into the sand, so mm, it's got that real pig aroma. This is the last job, lead-in bait. Now what I utilise is a really strong nylon cord such that only a crocodile can break it. And I string it off the ground so as when the croc comes up, smells it and bites it, I'll be able to get a set of claw marks here and to distinguish if it's my target crocodile or not. It's just coming on to dark. I'm starting to get a little bit nervy hanging so close to the water. Righto fellas, let's go.
The end of the day is a beautiful time in Lakefield. Many of the park's nocturnal residents are just beginning to stir, including one of the world's largest populations of bats, little red flying foxes. There are 10 million in this colony, three times as many as the number of people in Sydney, Australia's largest city. Magpie geese have started gathering too, flying into their favourite wetland breeding sites, but they won't start nesting till the rains begin. It's already getting cooler. Crocs spend all night in the water, which is warmer than the night air. They're reptiles. They've got to keep their body temperatures stable. No, thanks, mate. We might call it an early one, I think. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys. It's, it's been a big more. day for me and the team. Terry and I decide to have an early night. But as we sleep, others are at their most active. This nesting female must have been one of the first to mate this season. She takes up to an hour to lay around 50 eggs. The nest is a mound of dirt, grass and twigs with a central chamber hollowed out for the eggs. When she's finished laying, she covers the eggs with rotting vegetation to keep them warm during incubation. If all goes well, they'll hatch in around 90 days time. I've been awake half the night thinking about the traps and at first light, Terry and I go to check them out. The first one was empty, but the other one looks promising. Looks like we've got one, but is it the one we want? This is a beautiful little female. She'd only be around eight and a half feet, just maybe a bit more. It's very important that we get her out of the trap and release her straight away so we don't intimidate our big male that we're after. Isn't she gorgeous? Our target male will have seen his trap female and will most certainly avoid this trap. It's a good job we set two. I'm just going to see if I can drag her out, babe, so okay. get ready to move out of her way. Okay. Be careful. Yep. Uh, grab the net up. over there, babe. I've got her. You're, you're safe. Pull, pull, pull. Pull, pull, pull. Pull. That's it. Didn't have an aggressive streak in her whole body. Beautiful young female. Absolutely gorgeous. Let's reset the trap. The female we caught probably hadn't started nesting yet. It's still early in the season. Once a female does lay, she digs herself a wallow and sticks pretty close by to carry out repairs to the nest and protect the eggs from predators. 
She gapes, keeping herself cool. With the trap reset, Terry and I can take the time to have a look around. Looks like another crocodile nest up ahead. Wow, what a little beauty. Oh! Oh! I should have been a bit more alert. Now, this is a protective female. Isn't this beautiful? She must have laid her eggs last night. And when the female's laid her eggs, her maternal instincts click in and she's come up, whammo, get away from my eggs. Get away from my potential babies. I'm gonna do just that. You're all right, you're all right. She'll probably guard the nest until the eggs are ready to hatch. But it's a long job and not all mothers are so dedicated. This nest is unattended and it's caught the eye of a peckish passerby. Wild pigs, often eaten by adult salties, balance the books by feeding on crocodile eggs. This one takes just a few minutes to devour and destroy the entire clutch. Nobody goes hungry around the waterhole. It's such a rich source of food. These rock pools at the far end are teeming with life. During the dry, these permanent pools are refuge to a myriad of wildlife, including freshies. Have a look at this. Here's the remains of last night's meal. They're yabbies crayfish, and the freshy that ate them is probably still around. There's one under here. Have a look at this little blighter. Crikey, he's as fat as mud. These water holes are just crawling with wildlife. There's yabbies and fish biting at me which is perfect for these little freshies. Hey, where are you going, mate? Oh, he should come in, the water's so cool. These pools hey. are also the perfect place to cool off. I think these rock shelves are all shaded over and keep it cool. Ooh, it feels great. Yeah. But hang on a minute, what's that? Looks like something else had the same idea. It's a sand goanna, another real ancient reptile, and another predator of croc eggs. If I can get close up, I'll show you just how big it is. It's about five foot long, one of the largest lizards in Australia. Reptiles have been here for a lot longer than humans and they're better adapted to this rocky terrain. That forked tongue tastes the air, picking up any traces of a potential meal. Or a potential problem. Like the crocs, goannas are masters of their domain, the product of nearly 100 million years of evolution. This thirsty wallaby's not sure if the goanna is friend or foe. Faced with this puffed up throat, it's not hanging around to find out.
Back at Old Faithful, it's now a waiting game for me and the team. All we can do is keep checking the traps. It's dawn again, and me and Terry head for the trap opposite the campsite. As we get closer, we can see there's a croc in the net. It's him. First job's to get a top jaw rope on. I'll just utilise a stick. That way when he crunches down on it, it'll break and it won't hurt the crocodile. I've got to try and feed it in between his jaws. The top jaw rope's vital for getting control over this huge animal. Nothing, dude. Yeah. It's a very intense moment. The chance to try something nobody's ever tried before. Normally, nuisance crocs are shot, locked up or relocated to a more remote area. Even that doesn't work. Crocs have superb homing instincts and will travel hundreds of miles back to their own territory. But if my hunch about being able to change their behaviour is right, we'll be able to leave them safely where they are and that's good news for humans and for crocs. Of course, he doesn't know that and right now he's got his jaws wide open in the attack position. He's gonna go, I think. Here we go. You're all right, mate. They don't fight often, but when they do, it's explosive power. And that's where this top jaw rope comes in really handy. Here comes me team. Give us a hand to get the barricade off, fellas. Barry's bought reinforcements. The more muscle power, the better. We need to... We just need a moment to be sure what's the best thing to do. We were gonna build an enclosure to hold our croc overnight, but looking at him now, he's just too big. What I think we'll do, mate, is... The most important the thing is to cause him as little stress as possible. Despite their size, crocs are particularly sensitive to stress. They're designed for short, sharp bursts of action. A long struggle can be fatal. That's one of the drawbacks of removing them from the wild. The journey alone can kill them. We decide to leave him right where he is. The other thing we don't want to do is sedate him. That's another good way to kill a croc. It puts his system under too much strain. Instead, we want to calm him down as quickly and naturally as possible. Through here, Wes. Okay, now, make sure you can clear it and just let it drop if I say. Gonna go. Here you go. Put the weight on, that's it, hold him. We got him. Good work, fellas. I'm going to keep going. That's one flat pig. OK, I'm happy. Let him down, Doug. Now that we've got him secured, settled and relaxed, quite comfortable I guess, we'll get some buckets of water and we'll cool him down, keep him moist, 
because we've decided to keep him overnight and we'll get lots of water in and around his cloacal region, wash all this dead pig around so there's no chance of infection and try and keep him as happy as a pig in mud. It's vital to keep his skin well watered. It's tough, but it can still dry out and crack. And a few hours in direct sunlight could be downright fatal. He's a reptile, so he can't regulate his own body temperature. We've bought a big tarpaulin to provide some shade. This is really nice and shady, quite cool with that breeze blowing through. It's important that we leave him alone now for a few hours just to let him relax. Terry stays behind to keep an eye on him. When night falls, Barry and I return to the scene to educate our troublemaker about spotlights and boats. We're hoping to teach him to link fishermen's lights and the sound of outboards with his experience in the trap. That way when we release him, he should be keen to keep away from them. We can't be sure we'll succeed, but it's worth a try. Anything to keep him in the wild. It's a long night. When dawn breaks, Terry takes over from Barry, but I want to see it right through to the end. I really want this to work. And I'm depending on our croc's long memory to do the trick. At last, it's time to let him go. And again, it's all hands on deck. Everyone's pretty quiet at this time in the morning, including the crocodile. Okay, um, grab the top jaw ropes and the anchor rope. And what we'll do is, in a minute, we'll just drag him towards the water. Okay, Dougie, if you can just keep your jaw rope and down low. Ronnie, Ian, you're right. Okay, when I call it, I'm gonna go on his head. You're backing me, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go in first. Just put a bit of weight on there. The kindest and safest way to control a croc is to get as many people as you can to sit on him. He's a huge, strong animal, and it doesn't do him any harm. It's much better for him than giving him a sedative. Right? Yep. Okay. okay, let's go into a seated position. Get your legs each side of him. And um, get up as close as you can to each other because people are going to count. The more we get on there, the better. Are you confident, mate? Yep. Sure? Yep. Okay, because I'll, I'll be right here too. Okay. Righto, uh, you can drop it down. And if you could get on the um, crocodile, kind of scoot up as much as you can. Whatever you do, babe, don't don't complicate Wes. Okay, Dugger. Let it go, Doug. From here on in, if he starts to react, we're going to have to ride it out. There's no way he can get off or balk or do anything. It's just we're stuck with it now. This is it. 
So just hang on. The top jaw rope's the last to go. Can you grab that bazaar? I want to lift his head up, Wes. I never get complacent about those snappers, especially this close-up. Get off him, Wes, and come round. And, and lift him up. Someone else is going to have to lift the croc. I need his front legs out. Front legs coming. Get your weight off him, Tear. Okay, now I need to move up onto his head, Tear. Baza, follow up to the neck. It's a pretty tense moment. Everyone's got to be in exactly the right position. Okay. So his whole body from the back legs has to come down towards the water. Okay, when I call it, I want everyone off, exit out the back and stand at, uh, like out the back of him. I got the eyes, I got the eyes. Okay, go. Covering his eyes helps keep him calm up until the last second. He's less fearful if he can't see what's going on. He's a little bit disorientated. It takes him a minute to get his bearings. He's a beautiful animal, back where he belongs. And that's the whole point of the exercise. That's where we want him to stay. We'll be back later in the year to monitor the situation. But for now, we need to get out of the park fast, before the rainy season starts. The roads will soon be flooded. If you don't get out in time, you can be stuck here for three months. It does happen. Last year, a German couple left it too late and their hire truck was here all through the wet. Must have cost them a bit more than they bargained for. With the monsoon and rising flood levels, male crocs like to spend all their time in the water. But nesting females must continue to guard their eggs. Other mothers take advantage of the new grass revived by the rains. 
as do the thousands of magpie geese that fly into Lakefield to breed. This thirsty dingo, skin and bone after the harsh conditions of the dry, can look forward to easier pickings to come. Food is more plentiful for all of Lakefield's inhabitants and the park is blooming. Three months after we left, Terry and I returned to Old Faithful to check on our problem croc. The only way to find out if he's learned his lesson is to see how he reacts to our return. We've been here for a couple of days and so far there's no sign of him, but the waterhole is still flooded. He might be further up or down the river. The rains have been really heavy this year, and for one mother, it was a disaster. The young female I disturbed back at the start of the breeding season didn't build her nest on high enough ground. It's waterlogged and the eggs are ruined. But there's a new sound in the air around Old Faithful Waterhole. The female we saw laying has been successful. Deep in the nest, some of her eggs have already hatched and the newborns are calling to their mother. She clears away the top layer of grass and twigs to uncover her young. And the first hatchlings head for the daylight. Their mother's mighty jaws become a gentle cradle. Some of the babies hitch a free ride to the water. Meanwhile, the rest of the brood hear the squeaking and begin to emerge. The hatchlings are less than six inches long, but perfect miniatures of their mother. They're quite capable of making their own way. At this age, their legs are strong enough to easily lift their bodies high off the ground. Once in the water, there's safety in numbers, so the babies gather together. And for the first few weeks, their mother stays close by. But the hatchlings have many enemies. Fish, birds, not to mention other crocodiles. They'll be lucky if even one out of this 50 survives. Right now, we're still wondering if our problem croc is going to show his face. Terry and I have seen absolutely no sign of him, but if anyone's going to spot him, Barry will.
This is Big Croc headquarters, but he still doesn't seem to be at home. Then, suddenly, the moment of truth. There he is! This is looking good. We've seen our large male crocodile, but as we approach him, he submerges and seems to go up the other end. Although we can't say for sure, it looks like he may remember his night in the trap. That could be good news for the fishermen who come here. And good news for our croc and all those like him. As human populations expand in Australia, we've got to learn to allow these super predators their space. This new approach could help us leave them in the wild where they belong. That way, they'll always be crocs down under. <laughs>